Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Will, good to have you. Likewise, you too. Uh, it's, it's great to uh, get back uh, together and talk fintech again after the long winter break. It's a new world, but it's, uh, it's the same world. And so today we'll talk about uh, three things that are the same. They're all from the past, uh, but they're sort of having this, this interesting renaissance. Uh, we'll chat about uh, SoFi. Uh, and the SPAC around that, uh, around Bakkt, uh, B-A-K-K-T, and the SPAC around that. And then, of course, our favorite uh, embedded finance player, Plaid, uh, and the B- Visa deal. So um, that's our agenda today. Is it pronounced Bakkt or Bakkt? Bakkt sounds like the European pronunciation. Oh, well, be- being in London, I have to give it the German treatment, you know. It's... Okay, <laughs> got it. Um, so what's going on? What's going on with SoFi? All right, so as part of this um, this this now fully fledged SPAC boom, uh, SoFi is is acquired effectively. They're they're the, they're the target uh, they're, uh, of a combination. So a combination with a SPAC run by this guy Tremont, whose last name I can't pronounce, um, who has you know just just an amazing legacy in I think first Facebook and then venture capital and then. Yeah, most most recently, uh, SPACs, and for a full deep dive on SPACs, especially SPACs around fintech and how they work and some of the dynamics and incentives uh, and and why you know some investors think they're a great thing. There's a rebank episode that we did late last year with Ryan Gilbert, who's the the CEO of uh, Olympus acquisition company or a corporation or something. Nasdaq listed SPAC. I think they raised something like. I'm going to I'm going to forget this but something like 750 million dollars. So in the case of the the SoFi combination this SPAC or 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 maybe combination of you know SPACs or or vehicles had raised something like 800 million dollars in cash uh and they're also now as part of this deal raising like a 1.2 billion uh ballpark private like basically private pl- placement uh a pipe to help fund this acquisition. And long story short, SoFi being acquired by a publicly listed vehicle is, ne- is you know, assuming this, this all closes, will be publicly traded. The SoFi ownership you know, kind of rolls up I- into these um, listed SPAC shares. The SPAC shareholders, assuming they approve the acquisition and, and stay in it, become shareholders of SoFi. And it values SoFi at something like $8.65 billion which is something like, I don't know, two, two billion, two, three billion more than its last um, private funding. And it's something like, you know, half of what Chime is valued at now. And it's, and it's lower than, I don't know, Robinhood and some others. And basically the SoFi concept is originally uh, student loan refinancing. So people pay 8% to borrow from the U.S. federal government for uh, education loans. Everyone does. It doesn't matter. They don't even look at your credit score, I don't think. And what SoFi said is people that graduated from Harvard are probably uh, lower credit risk than the 8% would reflect. So we can actually refinance their student loans at 4% or 3% or whatever it is. And this has been a great business. And basically from there, they branched out into you know a tr- traditional like diversified banking offering. So everything from uh, personal lending to, you know, quote unquote, checking accounts. I think they're actually run on a like a brokerage stack, debit cards, uh, investments, and you know they have this this great uh, growth story going forward that they're telling to everyone who uh, participates in the existing SPAC and might you know might also become a shareholder in the future. Yeah. So if if I could um, hop, hop into caricature it even a little bit more, right? Like as you're saying. Uh, 
10 years ago, 12 years ago, whenever it was, uh, SoFi is starting to do this arbitrage. They're arbitraging the government's decision to non-discriminate for student loans. Um, and it's a 400 basis point arbitrage, uh, and they're getting all the sort of wealthier, better credit students from business schools and law schools to, to come to them. And if you're running a lending business, all you're doing really is printing money now uh, because you're, you're taking fees up front and you've got credit risk way, way, way in the back. Um, so on a revenue basis, you look pretty fantastic. And so um, because you look fantastic, you might pick up 500 million or a billion from your friends at SoftBank and all of the other fintech VCs, which are trying to build gigantic consumer brands, you know, and are doing it on consumer growth and revenue growth and not really are super worried about credit risk. Now you fast forward 10 years and uh, the world is in many ways on fire. Everybody's bankrupt, money is being printed every which way. Um, and it so happens that your largest investor SoftBank um, itself is uh, you know, losing 12 billion bucks, printing $10 billion options contracts, um, uh, on, on tech companies and all sorts of shenanigans. And you start getting calls. You start getting calls from a variety of billionaires, from people that are managing um, hedge funds and creating these SPAC structures to the you know, Facebook billionaires like Chamath um, who, are, who are printing uh, SPAC structures to fintech billionaires uh, or mere deca millionaires like uh, the, the Bancorp's Betsy Cohen. And so you start getting these calls saying, wow, you, you have some nice economics, let's go public. And so this is, I think this is the first sort of fancy one, right? The first fancy fintech that, that is going this route. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, from, I, I think from, from what I've seen, yes. Um, maybe where some of the other SPAC combinations in fintech have been has been more like kind of payments and infrastructure and you know, the stuff that makes a lot of money uh, that is less, you know, kind of noteworthy household name consumer brand. Uh, SoFi definitely is. I forget which stadium in um, California is, I think in California is called SoFi Stadium. I don't know, maybe San Francisco or something. But, um, you know, clearly a a consumer brand. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think that that is actually useful in many ways. You talk about markets being super efficient and it's all about, you know, discounting forward cash flows and whatever but but actually i think there's a lot of um you know human psychology in it too and and having having a household name brand can be valuable a few thoughts that i wanted to to share as we dig through this so firstly that one of the points that ryan gilbert made uh, in the in the podcast we did uh what couple i don't know two probably two months ago now uh around you know why why us back and why it was in, in his view, better than an IPO, but at the very least, you know, what some of the differences were between SPACs and IPOs. One of the things that he called out was the fact that, especially around tech businesses and taking tech businesses public, rather like, you know, kind of VC-backed tech startups, right? The type of business that burns cash for years, and then eventually, if all, all goes well, makes a lot of money in the future. What he said was, for, for an IPO, you can't you can't provide like forward-looking statements. You can't really talk about the future. And with a SPAC combination, you can because actually the SPAC is already publicly listed and, and really all they're doing is just is just buying a company. Uh, and so it's kind of a shell company and, and, and therefore the you know the target ends up effectively publicly listed, but without the you know the IPO process and all the regulations that uh, come with it. So basically, they they could make forward looking st statements as they're talking about the SoFi acquisition and and how good SoFi is going to be going forward. And if you if you you know sc scroll through the the deck right the the investor presentation that they put together, I guess to encourage the SPAC uh, shareholders to to you know support the deal. It, it, I mean, it reads like what's the right word? Uh, quite optimistic. For, for for lack of a more loaded term. I mean, it's literally, you're looking at a company that has burned cash that has lost significant uh, amounts of money for years, like basically forever, and and magically starting in 2021, uh, everything's profitable. And by 2025, they make a billion dollars in profit. 
And, you know, there's some information about, I don't know, how they expect their, like, customer base to evolve, how they expect the products that they currently offer to grow and where they expect to add new products and, you know, how basically the the economics of SoFi in the future, at least in terms of the you know, direct-to-consumer business, work if they can deliver, I think, what they call cross-buys, but what, you know, Wells Fargo and 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 their you know phantom account uh, targets call cross sell like the the more you can cross sell be nice be nice <laughs> the more you can cross sell your existing customers the better your economics okay that that appears to be the concept uh, so if i definitely offers a a broad range of products but it i think it will be interesting to see whether they can cross sell their customers uh, to the extent that they hope they can uh, and and also, I guess the extent to which the product offering that SoFi has and the the economics around individual products, how how well those actually pair kind of um, w- with each other around the, the existing customer base that SoFi has. And just just to round this point out, Lex, and I'll pass it over to you. Ann Bowden of Starling told us something interesting in. Uh, in a conversation we'd had with her again, probably a month or two ago, which was basically that if your customers are uh, you know, middle income, skewing affluent, i.e., they're you know they're cash rich, and you're offering them checking accounts and debit cards and and investments type products, they're probably not also in desperate need of personal loans. And at least in the Starling example, they run their the 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 liability side of their balance sheet, i.e., the deposits with that more affluent user base and then they're you know they're basically looking at other ways of deploying uh that that capital you know the asset side of their balance sheet not directly to their existing customers so if if you look at the sofi presentation it basically talks about cross-selling checking account holders with personal loans and with i don't know credit cards and with student loan refinancing i think there's some products in there like like home mortgages and and potentially student loan refinancing that do make sense for, you know, cash rich Henry's like the type of customers that, that SoFi has, and and I think continues to target. But there are other products in there, which I'm just not sure uh, are, are are most easily distributed to, to people that already have cash flow that are like white collar professionals, that graduated from these, you know, Ivy League or, or top tier schools that we we're talking about at the very beginning, and that came into SoFi via the um, the, the, the student debt refinancing offering. Now, you know what? I'll pause there and then we can bring it all together around Galileo after I give you a chance to, yeah. to share a little bit. So, you know, one part of me really wants to cheerlead for SoFi. Um, there are only so many quote unquote good, uh, large fintechs and, SoFi has built a fantastic brand and it's done lots of people a huge service through really useful products. Like I am personally, I was a SoFi customer when, um, when I was at Columbia doing the JDMBA and they saved me a whole bunch of money and it was obvious that they were saving me money the moment I signed up for their product. And so I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And I think the sort of the profitability point, you know, lots of people will point to Amazon and hand wave various tech company arguments that I think at this point we're, we're sort of beyond, right? So um, there are a couple of things for me that, that stand out, uh, one of which is, uh, we, you know, we're, we're actually seeing some data about SoFi. So end of 2018, they had 650,000 uh, users, members, customers, whatever. Uh, so 650,000, which is not, you know, that's not, that's not worth a billion bucks in venture funding. Um, and today they are at 1.7 million, which is getting closer. Um, you know, so 1.7 million, so about 2 million people, um, you know, is that, uh, should that be a two billion dollar valuation, which is kind of a thousand bucks per person, or should it be an eight uh, billion dollar valuation, which which is uh, four thousand bucks per person. I think that's that's one of the gaps uh, relative to market that we see based on the other players like Starling and Monzo and Revolut and Chime, where we can do the math. Um, arguably, it, it's tough to know, right? Because if they're 
if they're users of their like free financial, uh, I don't know, like like budgeting tools, then it's probably not worth very much. And if they're all student loan ref- refi customers, then it's probably worth a lot. It's tough to know. Yeah, and I think it's that, and I think it's I think it's probably the borrowers, which means this is a very transactional business. This you know this is a business where every year you're starting uh, to, to generate new loans from scratch, um, which gets me to. Um, you know, to this other point, which is we've been talking about bundling and rebundling the product set and kind of how SoFi is aggregating everything and Revolut's aggregating everything and Square, Square's Cash App is aggregating anything. Um, and SoFi, you know, they have a robo-advisor. They've got wealth management. They've got mortgages. I think they got some insurance thing. Um, they've copied Robinhood. They've got, um, I think, crypto access. And so for me, what was kind of like wild was seeing the the revenue chart. So they generate uh, in 2020, 620 million in revenue. Now that is fantastic for a fintech startup, you know, granted again, multiple billion in, in funding, but still pretty good. Now, if you look at that 620 million of revenue, 80% of it is lending. 80% of it is underwriting, right? So 514 million, uh, they say, is, is from underwriting. And now that can be mortgages and student loans and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that is, you know, that is transactional borrowing um, where you, you have a very certain relationship with your client. Now, another 100 million is from the quote unquote tech platform, which uh, we'll put a pin on about Galileo and sort of the gem that is. And then 11 million is from financial services outside of that. Now, I don't know how this all breaks down, but it was very surprising for me to see that sort of like the bundling thesis is generating 10 million of other financial services revenue. You know, the Robin Hood competition stuff is generating 10 million bucks relative to 500 million of kind of core lending. So end of the day, what you're what you're buying in this in the SPAC is a consumer lending business uh, with a couple of bells and whistles attached. Um, and that's somewhat different from what I expected it to be, to be honest with you. So I, I can't remember the exact number. I think maybe it was something like 50 million. But they talked in the press release about earmarking 50 million specifically to restructure SoFi's balance sheet to make it more conducive to an OCC banking charter. So, you know, I, so if I had already applied, I think, for, for a banking license, it kind of again been, been back and forth, but I think most recently, you know, within the past year or so, they had reapplied or made it clear that they were going to. And, and so it, it does appear that there's a continued push in that direction. And, you know, t- to your point about, okay, your, your lending business, l- low, cost, uh, low cost funding is important if you're a lending business, if, if you have a banking license now. You know, NIM is potentially net interest margin potentially one of you know, one of if not your biggest revenue stream. And you know, if you look at SoFi's product set and who they appear to be uh, looking to appeal to, it, it's I mean, it's it's more or less akin to like a Chase or something, right? That they have they have lending, they have personal accounts, they have investments. Uh, looks like they're going to have credit cards in the future, and they're trying to appeal to this middle income skewing affluent uh, user base. Chase is valued at one point seven more or less uh, times book. Now we don't have visibility into to SoFi's balance sheet, but you know it, it just gets back to this this question that I think those of us in digital banking have been been asking ourselves for for years now, which is does the kind of bridging that gap between you know crossing crossing the the chasm between tech valuations and bank valuations, and and how do you you know look to support a tech valuation? Because you're you know, offering great technology and you're efficient and you're I don't know riding the wave, versus uh, the fact that a lot of your peers, especially if you're SoFi and you, and you get a banking license and you continue to offer this you know bundled financial services offering, you, you really end up looking a lot like Chase. So question mark around valuation and and how that trends over time. When you're ready, we can tie it together around Galileo. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and so I think they they want to be this diversified player. They want to have thirty percent of their revenue come from investing and, and asset management and and banking deposits. And um, I think if if that happened, if that were the case, um, 
generally speaking, people will be better off. It will be a, a, a nice service that works and that people like, um, but it does hit that valuation point that you that you describe. Um, the final bit in their business that's um, revealing is this hundred million of revenue from the tech platform, which is surprisingly high for for me. I don't know if there's some categorization stuff going on, um, but the tech platform is Galileo, which is an embedded finance uh, sort of API play that supports a number of American neo banking platforms. Um, like Chime and, and Moneyline and, and SoFi itself and, in providing a pathway to, to cards and and banking services. And this was, uh, not to get ahead too far, but this was kind of three deals were announced at the same time. Plaid and Visa for $5 billion, with the idea that Plaid's revenue was around $100, $150 million then. Then Finicity and MasterCard as a competitive response. Now Finicity has closed the billion-dollar acquisition with MasterCard. Um, and then, of course, the Galileo SoFi acquisition, which was also a billion dollars in headline and about ninety million in cash. The rest in SoFi equity. So there was this moment in time where um, this made a lot of sense, and it's quite interesting to see it making such a chunky amount of uh, of the value proposition uh, in this in this sort of like SPAC IPO process. What do you think about Galileo? Is this kind of worth its salt? Yeah, yes. All right. So I, I think that the Galileo piece here is no, nothing short of the future of SoFi. So I definitely don't want to underplay the relevance of having a base banking license and literally printing money, right? Not not only in, in you know, literal terms, i.e. the way that loans are made and how they end up as deposits in, in bank accounts, but also... You know, the fact that with with net interest margin with the fractional reserve model you you make tons and tons of money as a bank so even like valuation aside and price to book versus price to earnings or whatever it is you print money as as a bank so great great you know and time tested business model so i'm i'm <laughs> so far is in at no risk of uh, of of you know ever collapsing or running out of money in the future if they go the banking route but I think the the even more interesting space is uh, is effectively embedded lending, for you know for for lack of a better word, and you can you can argue about what's embedded lending versus what's you know providing wholesale facilities and 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 ha- how how everything works in you know traditional and forward looking terms. But in terms of what Galileo does, you talked about how they support the you know a a large number, the vast majority I think from a customer standpoint i.e how many consumers are using these these banks the vast majority in the u.s and increasingly in latin america where they where they launched last year so we we went deep on galileo their business model and even the the sofi acquisition of galileo last year with clay wilkes on a on a rebank episode uh very very relevant i would hi- highly recommend everyone check that out clay is an amazing guy galileo is an amazing business and and we even, I mean, we even talked about it then, right? Like in that conversation with Clay, it seems seemed then, and it seems now, like the opportunity is for SoFi to deploy its balance sheet via Galileo to the Galileo customer network. So you talked about Chime right now. Varo, Varo is gonna. Well, I think they're gonna, you know, they're gonna move on to onto some of their own technology. I don't know about um, their relationship going forward with with Galileo and a number. I think current a number of others and. Also, now increasingly large number in Latin America. So you're talking about, you know, tens, if not soon to be hundreds of millions of consumer customers of these neobanks that all, you know, in one form or another run on Galileo's infrastructure. And the ability for SoFi to effectively lend money via Galileo to, uh, to, to accelerate the product offerings around credit for all these neo banks, and end up with with credit cards, with personal loans, with you know potentially other types of lending, even the student loan refi, even you know mortgages potentially, in the wallets and in the in the pockets of the customers of every single one of these neo banks. Like the, the distribution network is massive. If you pair that with a low cost of funding of you know SoFi as a as a deposit taker post-banking license. I mean, I, I think that's that's really the opportunity to achieve unprecedented scale in 
the banking space because because they own the infrastructure and the industry is clearly going in a direction where offerings like Galileo's, uh, this you know banking as a service slash embedded everything you know from payments to to lending to to other products like is is very likely to be the future. And to me, this is massive, massive fertile ground for SoFi going forward. Yeah. And this is why I'm so excited about my favorite public market company, not investment advice, the Bancorp, uh, right? Because the, the Bancorp's like, this stuff is all so interconnected. So the Bancorp is doing the actual cards and the issuance for a lot of the Galileo stuff. Um, Notably, the Bancorp's uh, founder, Betsy Cohen, is one of the folks who's been printing these fintech SPACs uh, now on number five. You know, so it's the, the whole thing is uh, the industry is very uh, interconnected. So I want to race. Um, I'm going to reorder and say, let's connect into Plaid and Visa just because the Galileo discussion is so close to the heart. So, you know, the, the piece of news is that Visa was buying Plaid for five Point three billion as part of its thesis around being the network of networks. Um, one of the networks being API connection of data uh, into all of the fintech companies, and so Visa would like to to do that via Plaid. Plaid being the leader in the in data aggregation and sort of payments like API connectivity. And then, um, for fairly mysterious reasons to me, um, the Antitrust authorities decided to to try and block this deal and uh, put together a lawsuit. I mean, in terms of things that matter for antitrust in a world where Apple is worth two trillion and Google and Facebook are there as well, stopping a Plaid acquisition seems really not important. But you know, here we are. Um, and so today or yesterday, it's uh, it's been publicly called off. So Plaid will not be acquired by Visa. Um, for lots of reasons, you know, one of the reasons that I suspect is um, the Google Pay application. So Google's core financial application, which recently came out fully stacked with uh, fintech features, is powered by Plaid for data aggregation. You know, so that's closed, that's released, that's in the wild. That's a Plaid customer. Google's a Plaid customer. You know, so. Uh, that's a lot of leverage for Plaid. So in, I guess my short take on this would be from a financial perspective, I think that the cancellation of the deal is probably a loss for Plaid. But from a strategic perspective, it is for sure a loss for Visa. What do you think? So that, that's an interesting one. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the market moved so fast since the time that this deal was originally announced. Like, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Plaid's valuation you know, it is, is now, you know, higher than, than even, you know, even what v Visa would have been offering, you know, like j just because of how fast everything has moved. So, you know, potentially th there's actually, actually some, some value, um, created for, for Plaid as, as a result of this, um, look, Plaid has a, has a strong business cause they have lots and lots of customers and they've done the hard work of connecting all the banks. I think they're in the process. It feels to me, uh, and and I sure hope they are, of almost like taking the next step, which is to to get closer to banks. And instead of you know like version one was screen scraping, version two is you know some banks start offering APIs. Version three is like Plaid needs to like show up, especially at the banks that it has antagonistic relationships with. I think Capital One is one of them. I think PNC is one of them. And I think there are a handful of others like sh should just show up and say, like, we're, we're your partners and we're going to, you know, we're going to do the work and we're going to get you connected. And here's the value that we're going to create for you and, and really just like push this whole space forward and actually do an amazing service. They've already done a great service for, you know, for, for the U.S., um, you know, financial services market and, and customers, you know, at, at the end of the day. But I think there's so much more that they can do. Now I have to admit that because you know we're talking about data and different ways of monetizing data, and it, it it gets pretty nebulous in my mind pretty fast. You know, like I think I think they're really smart people that uh, for whom it's intuitive, like exactly what you know the the tenth step is for Plaid and where the you know where the monetization comes comes from. 
uh, post, you know, j- just the, the simple API call, um, you know, p- paper, paper call model that they currently have. And in fact, those people who, who fully understand the economics of the data aggregation model and all its nuances and where it could go, it'd be fascinating to get some, some insight. Uh, but, but that's, I guess, always a bit of a, a question mark in, in my mind. Um, I'm sure there are lots of interesting places you would, uh, you could go. You probably have, have a clearer sense than me. I'm just not sure what they all are. Yeah, you know, it's it's another one of these names that I want to cheerlead because we're on on their team. Like we, I I want them to win, you know. But if it was a hundred million bucks at a five billion dollar valuation, let's say they kill it, and now they're running at a billion in revenue on API calls on data aggregation. Is it really the like? Look at Thomson Reuters. Look at Finastra. Look at um, any of these companies that are sort of in the in the Bloombergish intermediation of data business. That is not a fifty x revenue. Um, so I think if they were printing a billion in revenue uh, and were at like you know four hundred million in profit, which I can see them getting there in the next couple of years. That to me is still not a fifteen billion dollar business. I mean, um, so I I do wonder about that, about how this will end up playing out. But I could see them, you know, if I'm, for example, Microsoft or IBM, if I felt loose with my leverage, I would definitely consider, or if I were Goldman Sachs too, I would definitely, you know, consider spending five to ten billion on Plaid uh, to to have the number one position in this in the market. Interesting. Oh, but but I did want to say one more thing there, which is that um, Visa. It, this this I think is most you know most damaging for I don't want to say damaging, but I, I think the Plaid acquisition by Visa was a huge opportunity for Visa, huge opportunity, and and, and this you know this is something of a setback as a result. You know, um, you know what is what does Visa do now? More of the same, so to speak. More innovation along the you know, lines that they're already innovating, like the kind of payment by card rails, I think they call it Visa Direct and, and other things like that. And of course, you know, j- just a just a cash cow of a business. And I'm sure there, you know, continue to be massive growth opportunities around online payments and maybe in, in emerging markets or whatever it is. But this this did, you know, this acquisition to me felt like an opportunity for Visa to really make something of a quantum leap in terms of you know, being the main payment uh, connectivity provider of the world. Yeah. And and so a bit of a blow for them for sure. Poor poor Visa, you know, just <laughs> left over a five hundred billion dollar market cap. It's it's so hard. Um, look, we're we 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 always uh, run a little bit long in the tooth, uh, and um, and here we are. So let's let's close this out with uh, backed, balked, uh, whatever German techno band name you'd like. <laughs> you know, so th- this one is. Is is really uh, is really quite interesting, and it, it connects to the point you made about uh, you can make forward looking statements, you know. And so the background on um, on this company is that it's owned by uh, ICE, the uh, Intercontinental Exchange, which owns the New York Stock Exchange and a whole bunch of other global uh, capital markets exchanges. And exchanges generally are um, they have no idea what consumers want. Uh, exchanges know what large capital markets firms want. They know what hedge funds and market makers and and other manufacturers of financial product want. But in this case, we we had sort of a couple of weird years where uh, crypto assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and Ether on Ethereum, but also digital assets like blockchain anchored uh, private equity or real estate and so on, were driven by retail adoption and not by institutional adoption. And so one of the things that this exchange group did was try to launch a crypto exchange infrastructure. Now, Coinbase, which is going to IPO shortly, probably for somewhere between 15 to 30 billion in market cap, or Binance, which is you know just as valuable and prints multiple billion in revenue, those are crypto exchanges and people use those. Bakht is a... Uh, is is a business plan with uh, regulated infrastructure, and so it largely relies on uh, kind of regulated adoption or institutional adoption, and to be the venue for for institutional trading of crypto assets. 
There's lots of players that do this. Gemini, you know, with, with a Vinkel Voss, um, and a variety of other players, Cumberland, and and so on. There's Bitco as the custodian. Uh, and so when you look through the materials of the company, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, what they've built and the institutional relationship to the exchange. And then there is just like this unbelievable, truly unbelievable chart of uh, user growth. And like the user growth starts in 2021 and it's zero in 2020. Uh, and then they curve it up uh, and on this, you know, to 30 million people. And the other charts on the page are Chime and Robinhood. So this representation that 30 million people are going to show up to use the app uh, to me is pretty wild. Just to close it out on the positive side, they've got 400,000 people who've signed up to get the app when it's ready. They've got a partnership with Starbucks, given, again, this is a large company that's doing it. And then the SPAC that's trying to... Um, uh, take it out is valuing the whole thing at around, I think, a little bit over two billion. So, I find this really interesting because it's sort of this pre-product market fit concept phase uh, internal technology build thing, which is going public before uh, winning the market. Um, and you know, and I wonder whether it even, you know, does it even hit your radar, uh, or is it just an aberration in crypto land? I'm gonna speak as probably like your your average consumer of of crypto you know news and information and you know i kind of maybe watch it out of the corner of my eye mostly when bitcoin hits forty thousand, and i'm like you know what what just happened oh my god this is so interesting oh my god i should have invested in this such a long time ago and then you know and, and then you see stuff like backed and on the one hand you're like simplistically oh wow okay this this must be the future because bitcoin's at forty thousand. Which I assume is how most, even smart people and investors and people in finance think about the world, um, or at least think about these things in crypto. But the biggest question mark in my mind, like when I read about Backed, is what is it? Like it, it says it's a consumer app where you can manage basically all of your digital assets. And I, and I think their definition of digital assets is like Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, Starbucks, uh, I don't know, credits and Target gift cards and, you know, Delta, uh, Sky Miles or, or, or whatever it is, like all these things. And you can just you can just manage them all in this app. And I, I don't even know what that means. Like the, the implication as as I read it is like somehow you can convert them into fiat and or you, they become fungible. And that sounds really powerful. But it's it's a pure pure hunch pure assumption based on reading that uh, material. Uh, otherwise, I'm not quite sure what the app does. I just don't understand it. Uh, correlation, not causation. Uh, I think in 2017, um, when I was looking at this stuff from more closely from an equity research perspective, we saw a whole bunch of companies, like 30 different companies, change their name uh, to to have the word blockchain in it, and then they all got like a 20 to 30 percent price bump because people do trade on just a, a really shallow understanding of what the company does. I think what to me is is weird here is I do believe they will have one of the strongest regulated exchange infrastructures for you know cryptocurrencies as well as tokenized assets, whether it's the Sky Miles or something else. Um, but I think they're wildly underestimating how incredibly difficult it is and expensive it is to actually build a 30 million user consumer footprint. And on that, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining, Will. Thanks to you. Fascinating as always.